Patrick, um, it's been challenging trying to get the National Health Service in the UK to get on board with vitamin C, but there is um, a bit of uh, sunlight coming through the clouds in the in the possibility yeah. of a trial in the UK, in Scotland, that's going to be specifically looking at older people in care homes and vitamin C. Um, tell us about the Vita C for Care study that you're involved with. Yes, so I've teamed up with uh, Associate Professor Anitra Carr, who's actually from New Zealand, University of Otago, who's one of a really good vitamin C researcher, and Professor Pio Mint, uh, a lovely gentleman. He is the clinical chair of medicine and old age at the University of Aberdeen, and also Dr. Alan Snedden, who's from the Rowett Institute, uh, which is very well known all over the world for its work on nutrition and metabolism and also uh, NHS Grampian uh, with, uh, with Dr. Uh, Castora. And what we're going to do is go into care homes uh, in Scotland. And it's, it's a remarkably simple and clever little study because we're going to find out how much vitamin C is actually needed in older people in care homes. And the way we do this is that when we were talking about animals always keeping their blood level of vitamin C at a certain point. And when we look at the government who wants you to be above 50 nanomoles per liter in the blood, when you're at that level, you always have some vitamin C spilling into the urine. Mm -hmm. So you should always be excreting some vitamin C. It's, by the way, very protective for your, your bladder and so on. So when people say when you take vitamins, you just make expensive urine, you actually should be excreting some vitamins in your urine. So what we're going to do, we've got vitamin C sticks, pea sticks. Mm -hmm. uh, and we're going to give people every day, gradually an increasing amount of vitamin C and measure the vitamin C in their urine. By the way, it takes three hours to go from, you know, your food to your blood to your urine. So there's a delay. But every day we're going to crank up the dose a bit, a bit, a bit, a bit, a bit, a bit. And for each individual, we will find out at what dose they start to spill vitamin C into the urine. In other words, achieve their level. We have a separate study, by the way, looking at blood and urine. Um, so we know what's going on, but we don't want to jab a whole lot of old people. Uh, urine sticks are very, very non-invasive. So in this, this is, yeah. this is also completely independent of COVID initially, because uh, it's um, nothing to do with COVID. Just to establish the levels. Exactly. Yeah. It doesn't mean doesn't matter if they've been vaccinated or not vaccinated, etc. We're just simply asking the question, how much vitamin C does an older person in a care home need to have a normal tissue saturation? And, you know, that is like step one, because you don't have that and a virus comes along which rapidly uses up vitamin C, you don't have a chance at all. Uh, this is the study we're doing. It's a very clean study. It's relatively inexpensive. We can do all of this for £20,000. You know, I mean, as studies go, that's remarkably cheap. What kind of numbers would go through the program? It's, we need 30 people to do this. You know, it's not so many uh, to establish that. Uh, so it's a very clean, very simple, very obvious study that has not been done anywhere in the world. The information, the fact that we're doing in Scotland doesn't really matter. Uh, it's the same kind of demographics we have in the UK, America and other countries. But it's asking the question that is the so obvious to us. We cannot assume that a 20 year old needs the same amount of vitamin C, you know, as a 90 year old in a care home with comorbidities. And, and are you, you measuring that? blood levels alongside it or? No, we have, a, we have a separate study where we're looking at the dynamics of blood and urine. So we will already have established exactly how that works, but we don't need to be doing blood in these people. Uh, we just need to do the urine measurements because that will determine uh, you know, how you get to saturation. And also what I love about this study, I mean, it's a very important study to do. And you know, we obviously need money to do this. And the next study after that, we could then look at what happens if you give more vitamin C to someone who, who becomes infected, is that um, it uses such an incredibly simple measure that costs a barely a few pence, which is a, a vitamin C urine dipstick. 
So the point here is that I, I went to one intensive care unit, the Chelsea and Westminster, and I met the wonderful um, head of research, um, intensive care research there, Dr. Marcella Vizcaichipi, and she was already giving vitamin C, usually one or two grams, and sometimes getting kickback, you know, from others that, in the system who just are so anti-vitamins. We're so anti-vitamins in, in the UK. It's just extraordinary. Uh, the evidence does not support the position that exists within the NHS and the medical profession at all. And I said, you're a woman of science. How do you know you're giving enough if you don't test? And she said, you're absolutely right. So I gave her some vitamin C um, uh, dipsticks and she started to test people. And she found often that she needed to give six grams before there would be any in the urine. So what I'm saying here is what should be happening in these COVID times without a question in hospitals uh, is every single person who arrives in hospital with COVID should just dipstick in the urine, mm, no vitamin C, we need to give you some. You know, it's so cheap, it's so easy, it's so... So that, and that, that still is some distance away from a trial that's going to be telling the NHS, for example, what the optimum levels are for, you know, w within a, a critical care setting. It is, it is, but you know, we have over 30,000 people. I mean, our grandparents have died in care homes. In America, you know, the number is probably 100,000 people. And I know people have this sort of, oh, they're old and they're going to die anyway, and they sort of just pass it off. But this, this isn't right. Uh, these older people we know need more vitamin C. The question is how much more vitamin C do they need? And of course, as we eat away at the edges of the intensive care research on vitamin C and the, you know, eight gram on the, you know, all these different directions, eventually somewhere we hope the penny will drop because Linus Pauling in 1970 wrote a book on this and he put on the front page of the book um, that when the next uh, swine flu epidemic hits, everybody needs to know that the uh, you know, the symptoms can be massively reduced by the appropriate use of vitamin C. And somehow we've got to get people, I mean, do you know, in Wales, where I spend a lot of my time at, at our retreat center, Forest Barn, they know that when you get a cold, you have elderberries. Mm. It's just, you know, in the mentality. Yeah. And we need to get into the mentality, um, vitamin C. Vitamin D, I went for vitamin C, by the way, uh, the, the campaign on vitamin C, which is also where you can donate for the care home study, is called vitamin C four. It's actually the number four, but it doesn't matter. Vitamin C four COVID dot com, and uh, we now have almost a hundred. Uh, uh, we've got ten thousand active supporters. We have almost a thousand professors, doctors, nutritional professionals. Um, frontline workers supporting this campaign. And the reason I went really ballistic for vitamin C was not because I don't totally know that vitamin D is important or zinc or quercetin or anything else. But I knew that vitamin D was already being championed. And I knew that we had already over a hundred relevant studies on vitamin C. So the care home study is really important because it establishes something worldwide that needs to be known. And remember, if it turns out that an older person needs 400 or 500 milligrams, uh, you know, you need to eat 12 oranges to get there. Yeah. So in other words, you're going to have to supplement. Yeah. And the minute that penny drops, the older people actually need to supplement vitamin C daily just to have be at a normal level, then the idea of taking vitamin C supplements becomes, you know, as as easy as one would take a painkiller if you've got a headache. Absolutely. And the, and the tragedy of it is if you imagine the amount of uh, medications that are being used in a care home environment, huge amounts of the budgets are, are yes. going towards the NHS budget is going towards that. And we're yes. looking at an incredibly low cost vitamin. If you're not in a care home, chances are you can you don't have to wait for the government to tell you you can you can take it now um, but people yeah. in the care home may not be able to take it on their own without um, a directive from public health england so 
Um, Patrick, it's it's really important. If you could just say, you know, bottom line is you you can't get funding for this kind of project from any of the normal um, BBSRC um, research yeah. routes. So this is crowd funding of research and you're looking to people to, to make donations. So if you can just mention the website again. Uh, the website is vitamin C for covid.com. Uh, vitamin C for covid.com. If you go there, hit the donate button, it really, you know, 50 quid, 10 quid, 100 quid. Uh, we can raise, you know, whatever you can give makes such a difference. And by the way, also, it will help us. We, we're all doing this for nothing. Uh, so, you know, I'm, I'm not charging anything for any of my time. Most of the researchers that I've mentioned are just, you know, they're not charging either. We've kept the cost really, really low. So every penny you give, I mean, is will help not only the care home study, but it helps the whole vitamin C campaign. We hope to keep doing the essential research that's necessary to drum home the message. But on this point, grandparents' lives do matter. It's not good enough for us to allow tens of thousands of people to die, probably, ultimately, from a vitamin C deficiency. Scurvy in the 2020s. Scurvy is back and no one's talking about it. Patrick, thank you so much for getting the message out. We'll work with you. We'll try and get this out um, as wide as possible. Really important. This is a study. Just to, to finalise, uh, is the study going to start with some of the initial funds or was it not getting off, off the get-go until the funding is in? No, we need 20,000. We've raised just over 4,000. So we okay. need, we need it's, it's, okay. just, it's just going into ethics approval. I think you know that stage. Yeah. Uh, we have enough money to, you know, to present it, but we literally cannot start this study, which we hope to start in August, maybe the latest September. Uh, we cannot start it unless we raise this money. Perfect. Well, it's a very good time to do it now before um, any prospects of, of a third wave. Patrick, thank you so much for talking to us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.